Thank you. Uh, I will try and keep this relatively brief, since I appear to be the only thing currently standing between you and the beer, um, and I think that's probably fairly dangerous to be sat there. So I will keep this fairly brief. Uh, this, thankfully, isn't a photo of a rack I manage, um, but it's representative of some racks that I have encountered. It's a mess, and I don't like it, um, and I would far rather that they looked something more like that, which is a rack that I'd finished recabling for a client. If only every comms room that we all walked into looked like that. It would be far better, wouldn't it? <laughs> anyway, enough about spaghetti cables. Um, there's a few real-life situations that I'd like to talk about um, that I've had to go through over the last few years, and... These are all slightly bizarre and odd situations that probably should never have happened. But they did. Um, so the first one of these is um, bugs in switches. They're never fun. Uh, and this one was even more ridiculous than it should have been. Um, fairly standard scenario. We just moved a computer from one VLAN to another. For some reason, it wasn't behaving properly. Um, with its DHCP lease, um, and we thought, okay, well, well, we'll just bounce the port, that'll be fine. Still didn't work. Um, so then we, at that point, we started looking at what MAC addresses were on the switch, um, and I, sh I should add that these were uh, a, a certain brand of switch, which I think I've listed, um, and the site did not have uh, much money to run their network. However, I log on to the core switch, uh, hit type show MAC address table, because it was at least something with a CLI, uh, and my terminal hung, uh, which is uh, always, always an interesting experience when you type what should be a relatively harmless command and nothing comes back. Uh, and about a minute later, I get an interesting phone call from the guys on site, because I was actually remo working, working remotely at the time, um, and they say, why have we just lost all connectivity? <laughs> um, and about five minutes later, I get a connection closed by remote host <laughs> message. Quite where that came from, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but uh, essentially, what had happened was interesting, to say the least. We log back into the switch, and it's got an uptime of about two minutes. And you're sat there scratching your head, work, trying to work out why show MAC address table has just caused a switch to reload. Uh, it turns out that it looked like it was copying the entire MAC address table into a memory buffer, um, and said memory buffer was only a few hundred bytes. Um, given that this was a core switch in a network with 500 odd devices, uh, try and copy the entire MAC address table into memory, and you end up with a buffer overflow, and the whole lot falls over. Um, turns out that the same bug also exists in the web interface, which is where I discovered it five minutes later. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, in fairness, I probably should have seen that one coming, but, y y you know, you have to try these things. Um, the next one was a little bit more fun, and I think there's a few people in the room who possibly recognise, who may recognise this graph. Um, this, for those of you that haven't heard of it, this comes from a wonderful tool called Smokeping, um, and I won't say a huge amount more about it, uh, other than it's a really, really, really useful tool. Um, this graph uh, was running on my smoke ping instance um, in Docklands, pointed at something on a site. Um, and the particular incident in question, I don't actually manage the network on the remote site. Uh, however, I do have stuff behind it, which is slightly more inconvenient. Um, and this was on uh, IPv6. Um, and... Yeah, random intermittent packet loss. Uh, you can see here the, the red and the gaps and the purple. Um, and yeah, basi basically it was a mess. And we were trying to work out what was wrong with it. And we spent quite a lot of time digging into various possible theories. And then we went, actually, maybe it is a switch bug after all. Um, and then we found this. <laughs> there... The, despite several tickets being raised into the particular provi or the particular network organisation in question, um, 
they weren't really interested in fixing it um, because it seemingly only affected IPv6 and therefore didn't affect most of their service, which was really inconvenient. You then find that you've got this sort of bug lying around and the route, the, the long and the short of it is ICMPv6 to the all nodes multicast address on v6 just randomly doesn't pass through the switch. <laughs> um, this was actually leading to, uh, in this case, router advertisements going missing, which is why the packet loss suddenly occurs. Um, it took us a very long time to correlate all of this together to work out that actually this bug was the cause, uh, and we eventually just replaced the switch. We got them to replace the switch with something a little bit more sensible with a newer firmware on it. But the final one that I want to talk about today, um, I'll start with that, which um, some of you may have seen. I've borrowed that from Andrews and Arnold. Um, thank you ever so much to uh, Andrew at a, a for actually letting me use that. <laughs> okay, Neil. Um, basically, um, there's a bit of a backstory to this one. Um, essentially, uh, an internet provider that I was working for, we had installed a fiber circuit to, the ha to a house in the middle of the Surrey countryside. Now, as you can probably imagine, that came with its own set of challenges. Um, but I suspect many of the ISP people in the room have had similar situations before. Um, and it also involved the installation of new poles to put fiber on. Um, and this is qu quite important to the rest of the story. Um, but they ran fiber along poles to do it. So half past eight on a Saturday morning, um, I get the wonderful phone call telling me that that circuit's gone down. Um, we could still see the router through the backup circuit. Thankfully, said customer had a backup circuit, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and we, look, we raised a call out to the carrier in question who declared road traffic accident. And we all sort of looked at each other in the office and just went, what? <laughs> um, said circuit was still down four days later. We were still scratching our heads going, why? Thankfully, uh, I happened to be needing to go past roughly where this fibre was for, for another job. And I thought, right, I'm going to go and have a look and try and work out what's going on. Um, and I apologise for the slightly awful quality photo, um, but this was basically the first thing that I saw when I got to site. In case you can't see, that's broken. Um, and in fact, if, you, if we zoom in on that slightly, um, it's, quite bro it's definitely a broken cable. And we're going, is that really fibre up there? Um, and yeah, it was. Uh, it was a little bit broken, but that doesn't explain why it's broken. What was more impressive was what was on the other side of the road. That. Um, and yes, that's a telegraph pole, and yes, it's on the side of a road. Um, and yes, it's been snapped in half. <laughs> it was one of those wonderful moments where you go, I cannot possibly believe that I'm seeing this. Um, and moreover, that, that telegraph pole was the single telegraph pole that got installed just to provision this one circuit in the first place. No other services sat on top of that telegraph pole, and we couldn't believe it. Um, it actually took a good few weeks to fix this, uh, <laughs> because it was 400 metres of new fibre. We're not quite sure whether they actually needed a permit from the council to sort it, um, but there was quite a lot of gentle persuasion required in a lot of directions to get this to work. Um, and the sad bit was that about two weeks later there was a faulty fibre coupler in Docklands that took the circuit down again. <laughs> so with apologies to anyone in the room who wished that they'd forgotten this and actually dealt with it, um, that is the last of the little anecdotes that I'd like to talk about. But if you've got any questions, please to ask them, but I suspect you'd all like to go for beer. Um, and uh, yeah, 
Uh, I won't be sticking around for too long because unfortunately I have a flight to catch, but um, if there is anything, please ask. I think Neil's got one. Neil, Neil's obviously got one. Are there any other questions apart from <laughs> Neil's? <laughs> Um, so if, if a pole like that goes and it's near a road, um, we, have no, we, have, we have no choice but to close the road. Yeah. Close, closing the road is typically a three-month cycle. Yeah. Um, it's so, you know, on occasion you'll get special, you know, depending on the council and the impact. Yeah. You know, if it was the whole street down, they might, and they had, you know, people phoning up, yeah. it might move quicker, but it's a three-month process, typically. No, I understand and, that. And um, <laughs> in certain parts of London, it's six months to get a response, um, and it's not a guarantee that you'll get the response yes. Yeah, no, it, it, we, we just couldn't quite comprehend the, uh, quite how long it takes to achieve this sort of thing, especially when, especially when we had taken 24 months to install the circuit in the first place due to various digs across fields and copious other things. And we, it, only went, it was only up for about three weeks before, before that happened. <laughs> Uh, it was a waitrose van reversed into it or something. Like that. We Took don't actually uh, know. We don't actually know what, what went into it, but uh, it looked like some kind of lorry had gone into it. It was one of these wonderful country lanes in Surrey. <laughs> Are there any other questions? In which case, I'd like to thank Chris. Thank you.